our sermon title this morning is Put God First. We're talking about the first commandment. And what we are doing is we're sharing, um, Pastor Charlie had asked us after we had done the last one if we would break these down even further. We're not going to do all of them in one swoop. But today we're going to share more about what we learned in the first commandment. And so Tiffany read um, Exodus 21 to 3. And what we're talking about this morning is you shall have no other gods before me. But we want to remind you where we've been, where we um, took you guys last time. And I'm going to have Stephanie share a little bit of just a refresher of what we talked about when we were talking about all the Ten Commandments so that you kind of have a good jumping off point of what we were talking about. So we were talking about how um, all the, how we went through the Ten Commandments and what we learned from it. And we want to um, show a little bit more in detail, because we just kind of skipped over it. And so we are just doing the first one, like Brooke was saying, but we are added more to it this time. And I want to remind you, last time we read um, Deuteronomy 4.29, which said, But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then Psalm 16.8 says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And we did a Hebrew word study that was reminding us about what heart and soul refers to in Hebrew, it refers to God being at the center of life, God being at the center of everything that he so, if you'd like to open your Bibles with me to 1 Kings, chapter 17. And we're going to start out with a, a story, and actually two stories. So, while you're looking for that, you're going to be looking for 1 Kings, chapter 17, and you're going to start in verse 7. But I want to tell you something that happened to me uh, last Sunday. So, last Sunday, actually, this didn't start last Sunday, but this is... Um, <clears throat> this is when this story happened. So before last Sunday, I had decided that I was going to do this massive house cleaning thing. I mean, and it's not spring, but I guess I felt like I was going to do this. So I was, I was getting rid of stuff, and I'm putting stuff away, and I'm hauling stuff out of the house. I mean, I have top to bottom, but it's been like two week long process. So I'm doing a major, major work on this previous Sunday. And so I go out my door. I'm going to put something in the trash can and put something in my car. And I take my keys out so that I can put something in my car. And I go to the trash can. I dump the stuff in the trash can. I come back into my apartment. I don't know. Ten minutes later, I'm going, where did I put my keys? And I'm the type of person that has a place for where their keys go. Okay? And so I'm like, how come it's not in the place that I normally would be? This is the problem. And I'm searching. And what do you normally do in a case like this? You start retracing your steps. Well, where have I been? Well, the house is a disaster. How can I tell where I've been? Well, I just, you know, this room's in a state of disarray. My thing that I normally put in that cup is not where it normally is because I'm cleaning everything and rearranging everything. And I'm like, oh, okay, keys, keys, keys. Oh, maybe I accidentally threw them in the trash can. I've done that once, not to my keys, but to something else. But then I went, no, I remember when I walked to the car, I had the keys in my pocket, I clicked the little thing, and I put them in my pocket so I wouldn't accidentally put them in the trash can, so they have to be in this house. And that's the worst, when you lose something and you know that it's near you, you just don't know where it is near you, and I knew it was in the house. And I'm looking for it, and I'm like, and I'm praying as I'm walking by, okay, God, uh, any time now, help me find these keys. And finally, I'm like, okay, it's no big deal, I got extra keys, I can drive the car, I can get in and out of the house, I got extra keys. Wait, this is a big deal because all my work keys are on, the, on that other set of keys. I gotta find these keys. I have got to find these keys. Cannot find them. I don't know how long I'm wandering around the house trying to put stuff away and still thinking I gotta find these keys. And then thinking, well, I'll just wait, you know, in the morning. They're somewhere in here. I'll probably find them next week. I don't know because they're probably in the pile somewhere in an accident. And I'll find them. I can still get into work. I'm relying on myself. I can do this. So I sit down at the table, and I don't remember what I was doing. I was working on something else, and I close my eyes, and I'm just like, finally, like, okay, God, I have no idea where these keys are. You know where they are. I give up. I give up. I don't know anywhere where these keys are, and I really do need these. And as soon as I open my eyes, 
my keys were right there on a chair. Right. <laughs> and immediately I was like, thank you God, it just like popped out of my mouth. Wow. And I was so amazed. They had been there the whole time, trust me. Because I remembered right after I saw them, oh, I remember when I came in and I put them on that chair to do da 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 da. But I could not see them. Yeah. <laughs> my eyes were blinded and God literally opened my eyes, but he didn't do so until I actually stopped and said, you go first, because I had tried everything I could to do it, and I said, you know what, I give up, you better find it. I did it plain sight. Right in plain sight. So 1 Kings 17, 7 to 26 talks about somebody who had to have their eyes open, who had to realize that God needed to be number one in their life. And this is the story of Elijah and the widow. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to kind of summarize the story, but I want to let you know where it came from. So prior to this, Elijah is on the scene, and Elijah's a prophet of God, just to set that up. And he has told the king, who's Ahab, who's married to the wicked queen Jezebel, as we all know, um, that there's going to be no rain. God said there's going to be no rain. And he has fled to this brook, and he's being fed by these ravens, and he's got water until the water dries up. And this is where our story begins. So God tells Elijah, I want you to go to this uh, widow in this country. And interestingly enough, this is the exact same place that Jezebel comes from, if you think about it. God sends Elijah into enemy territory, if you think about it. This is the, the type of area. I mean, she wasn't from necessarily this town. But this is territory where Jezebel is from. And he sends him right into the heart of that to this widow. And when he gets there, he sees this widow, and she's gathering sticks, and this is verse 10. And he calls out to her, actually, let's back it up. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called out and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? All right, we got a famine going on, right? And he asked for, not this particular water bottle, but he asked for some water from this lady. And he says, hey, I need some water, I'm thirsty. And in that culture in particular, that's a sign of hospitality. So we, we see the lady kind of, okay, I'm going to go get you some water. And apparently their well was still going and wasn't dried up like the brook was where Elijah was at. And he says, oh, hey, um, by the way, could you command a little something to eat while you're at it? So the woman is at first when we see this is, okay, she's kind of going to go get him some water, and as soon as he says, I need a piece of bread, she's like, hold up. She says, wait a minute here. Do you know that at home, I'm gathering these sticks, I only have a little bit of flour left. I have enough flour left. And not only that, hold that, I only have a tiny bit of oil left. And I only have enough for me and my son to eat, and then we're going to die. That's it. Like, I can go get you some water, right? That's easy enough. But I don't think I can give you any oil or make you any bread. Now, that, that's Brooke's paraphrase there. But she stops, and she's like, we're going to die. I don't have enough to feed myself, much less you. But Elijah stops her and says, wait a minute. And this is verse 13. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself. So this is where this woman's faith has to be tested. She has to trust, and I know Elijah says more than we get to that. She has to trust that if she puts God's prophet first before herself, that God knows what he's doing and that he's taking care of her. Because immediately after that, Elijah says to her, For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, this is verse 14, The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord, until the day of the Lord gives rain on the land. So he makes a promise to her, You get me some bread, use that little bit of flour that you have left, that little bit of oil, make me some bread. Oh, you'll have enough to make some for yourself, I promise. God promises, actually. And not only that, but you're going to have enough, you will do this. You're going to have enough to feed yourself all the way through the famine. Whether I'm here or not, God has promised that he's going to take care of you this, this entire time. And so she goes and does it. It doesn't tell us what's in the back of the head. We, we sense the hesitancy when he first asked her to go get this. But it doesn't tell us what she says to do. It just says something that's very 
telling, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. But she had enough faith in what Elijah said, in Elijah's God, to go do what he had said. And not only that, but she was willing to put God first in this situation. But we could end the story there, and it doesn't end there, and I think you all know that. And that's because the... Story continues on to her son gets sick. So shortly, no one doesn't tell us how long after, she has at least one son. And in that time frame, um, we know she's a widow as well, so she has no husband. She's got the one son. In that culture, in that time frame, a woman needed to have a son or a husband to help take care of her. That's how this worked, okay? So the husband's gone, we know that, and we have the son, and the son gets sick. Immediately a trial comes up in her life, right? She put God first, and she says, okay, I'll feed your prophet, I'll do what you ask me to do, I'll get you some water, I'll make you some bread. And we see her reaction, very human reaction. Her son's dying, and she says to Elijah, did you come here to just remind me what a simple person I am? I mean, what, what, have, I done, what have I done to you? Like, why is my son sick? Like, I, I trusted you, I believed what you said, and now he's dying. And we know that he dies, and I'm going to skim over this just a little bit because as powerful as that part of the story is, it's not the moral of the story. And we know that Elijah brings his son back to life. What's important for what we're talking about today is this. Verse 24, then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. So even though she had a trial, she had to trust again that God knew what he was doing and that if she put him first in her life, if she put her needs aside and let God take care of the things that God takes care of, that he was going to take care of all of her. And it is a very important and very powerful lesson. So something we can learn from this is that God provides when we put our focus on him. Also, trials may come and distract us from placing um, God at the center of our lives, but that doesn't mean that we can't go back to like this woman did and realize, right, I'm off center, God, I'm, I'm not paying attention to, to what you're telling me. I'm going to put you first, I'm going to ask you first, I'm going to put you first in my life. So Stephanie's going to share some more about what happens when we don't put God in our life first. Okay, um, I'm going to ask if a couple people can read some verses for me. Um, statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Do I got seven too? No. Then I will sweep Israel off the map which I gave them. I will reject the house which I have consecrated to my name. And Israel shall become a proverb and byword among all peoples. And you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Then they say to them, It is because your father forsook me, declares the Lord, and followed other gods and served and worshipped them. They forsook me and did not keep my law. So these are all talking about like how we, if we lose sight of God, don't put him first. God can't help us. Because he wants us to. Yeah. So it's how can we put God first? <coughs> so it's we have to be able to put him first or for him to help us. So we got a um, couple more verses here. Mom, you want to read two James 2.19? Um, 
James 2.19. Oh, oh, Mom, oh, sorry about that. Are you ready for it? Yes. Okay, James 2.19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou dost dwell. The devils also believe and tremble. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in the spirit and in the <coughs> Jeremiah 16, 20 says, Do men make their own gods? Yes, but they are not gods. So there is um, a lot of gods in our lives. I know, personally, I have gods in my life. Um, technology is one for me. It's in everyday life, it wants to, got, um, Satan is trying to put everything he can in our lives to make them gods. Nowadays, you don't see, like, worshipping, um, carving, um, caps and all that, but you see all these other gods, if you want to say, idols in our lives. We all have them. But we can, um, if we stay reading the Bible and put our focus back on God, we ought to pray and talk to him, not just learn about him. We have to actually talk to him in prayer. We can listen to him. He's talking to us through the church, through friends, through everyone around us. We just got to listen. Watching out for temptations. There's a lot of temptations here. Um, we gotta, if we don't um, watch out for these, they will come in first in front of God. So we gotta keep putting God first and get, and, or other gods will get in the way. And this can include ourselves. Sometimes we get in our own path. Like I was mentioning with my car keys. What was the first thing I did? I went running around trusting myself that I would be able to find them myself. Uh, I suppose in theory I might have eventually been able to find them, but certainly it would have been a lot longer. And I can think about that story. <coughs> While I was praying, I wasn't praying wholeheartedly. I was praying like this. Okay, God, help me find my car keys. Leave it over here. Okay. All right, God, where's the car keys? Help me find me. It wasn't until I stopped, was not distracted by all the stuff that was around me, that God opened my eyes and said, there's your car keys. Now do you trust that I know what I'm doing? Is that all I'm going to do? Amen. So, um, we were, we are doing the weekly study, Brooke and I, and this week we are talking about the um, armor of God. And so I just thought, how fitting that fit um, with us doing the Ten Commandments today. Have no other gods before me. We have to put God first so he can be the strength in our lives. Because if we are the strength in our life, we are not putting God first. So we want to remind you as well where we're headed. This is a summary of what we shared with you guys when we did the Ten Commandments study. And there's nine more to go. We'll see when you guys will see us up here next. And this is our summary, as we said. This is not how the Ten Commandments are written out. If you're wondering why these don't look like your typical Ten Commandments, those of you who weren't there, it's because it was our summary. What was the, what was the main point that we got out of it? So today, as Stephanie was sharing, putting God first is where our strength comes in. And it's really the basis for, as we shared last time, for all the Ten Commandments. If we can put God first in our lives, everything else will fall into place. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your study of the First Commandment, where you do not want us to have any other gods before you, because really, as the verse is out, there are no other gods before you. There are no other gods. You are it, Lord. We are so self-reliant, especially in our, our culture, that we, like myself, tend to run around looking for things ourselves, um, even just simple things like car keys can remind us, Lord, that you have us in your hand and that you 
want us to focus on you and put you first, even in the littlest things, such as finding the keys that we've left in our own house. And I thank you, Lord, for the faith of the widow that Elijah went to, that her story can still resonate, that not only extending hospitality, but when we trust and gave you what we have, she gave the last of what she had, that bread, that bread that was from the flour and the oil, entrusted by doing that first, Lord, that you would take care of all of her needs. So I ask that we trust in you, Lord, and that we remember to put you first in our lives and allow you to be our child. Thank you.